Okay then, I'm back now once again with another 1997 pay-per-view review and this time it's going to be In Your House 15, A Cold Day in Hell. Now, I've literally just finished watching this and well, I wasn't really paying too much attention to it in all honesty, but I'll do my best to describe what happened on the pay-per-view and give you my thoughts and opinions on what happened, so let's get straight into it. The dark match was Rockabilly vs Jesse James. As I mentioned on my last video, this was a match from pay-per-view, and the last pay-per-view, so my last pay my last uh, 997 review was In Your House, Revenge of Taker. If you didn't see it, please go back and watch it if you're interested. If not, then don't bother. Um, but yeah. Rockabilly vs Jesse James was the dark match, and in this match, um, you know, I can't remember who won this. It was a pretty rubbish match. I'm tempted to say that Rockabilly got the win. I don't quote, don't quote me on that though. But yeah, this was just a dark match, so I wasn't really paying too much attention. Then we got, um, then the pay per view started. It was Flash Funk vs Triple H, Hunterhurst Helmsley, and this was a pretty decent match, in all honesty. Uh, Flash Funk did his spot monkey sort of. Um, moves, he was doing all the flips and all the tricks and uh, Triple H was his base and did a really good job in my opinion of carrying the match from a technical standpoint and really um, selling the moves from Flash Funk, so yeah it was a decent match, Triple H ended up getting the win, this was uh, the start of Triple H's rise and a few things that I did notice in this was uh, JR was really taking the piss out of Triple H's nose saying oh Flash Funk there with a hit and then J uh, the King was like, oh, he must have hit him on the chin. And then J I was like, no, I think he hit him on the nose. How could you miss it? I I'm sensing a little bit of hostility there between the two, like Triple H and JR. You know, um, this was, what, 1997 and not too long. I suppose it's like two years after the whole click incident happened in Madison Square Garden. But I'm sure J uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry, Jim Ross, I'm mumbling my words in this video, I'm a bit incoherent, I'm sorry, I will try and get better as it goes along. Yeah, I don't think Jim Ross was happy with him about that, so a bit of lingering hostility. But yeah, Triple H got the, one, got the win, he was obviously on his rise, um, he won the King of the Ring this year, didn't he? So yeah, uh, they were building him up there. Then we had Mankind versus Rocky Maivia in a decent match. It was interesting to see that uh, Mankind and The Rock were going to go against each other when they had such a long rivalry, didn't they, in terms of... Um, matches against each other and then tag teaming with each other. They had, they've got a decent history with each other, so seeing this early match between the two was really interesting with uh, Rocky Maivia, The Rock being a rookie and Mankind being the veteran who had to carry the match. Um, it was an okay match, nothing too special, um, nothing too horrible about it. Obviously Rocky Maivia wasn't that great in this because he was just starting off, but yeah, Mankind got the win. Uh, it was pretty original ending to the match, Rocky Maivere does like a Jimmy Snooker style dive onto Mankind off the top rope I believe it was Mankind rolls over and instead of going into the pin he goes into the mandible claw and then gets the win I don't know if he counted him out 1, 2, 3 or he passed out or whatever, however they used to do the finish with uh, Mankind then we had a gauntlet match, Ahmed Johnson against the Nation of Domination if Ahmed Johnson won he would finally get his redemption, he would finally beat Ron Simmons for Rook after all the about a year long rivalry at this point I'm guessing I'm sure they both debuted in 1996 and started rivaling, rivaling each other straight away. But yeah, if, if Ahmed Johnson won the Nation of Domination, would have to split up. It started off with Ahmed versus Crush. Now, on Raw, I think it was just the week before, they'd done a little segment where Crush was going to face three guys to show how easy it was to face three guys, one after another, and beat them all. Well, Crush beats the first job, but he beats the second job. Then the next guy comes out in the ski mask, and it's so obvious watching it that it was Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed Johnson comes in. And Jerry, Jerry King, Lol and Jay are like, well, I wonder who this guy is, I wonder who this guy is. It's obviously Ahmed Johnson. Ahmed Johnson hits you with a pearl rubber plunge pretty much straight away and gets the win. Then he runs away and it didn't make sense because he's, he's the face, he's the heroic face, he's the one who's trying to make them scared of him. But yeah, he got the pin and then he ran away from them. And then the nation all got in the ring and all angry then Ahmed Johnson takes his kind of ski mask thing off and it's Ahmed Johnson. He's like, yeah, I just beat you. But if he was that heroic, he would have stayed in the ring and fought them all off, so it didn't make too much sense, but, you know, it's all a bit of fun, isn't it? So, yeah, Ahmed Johnson, first of all, against uh, Crush, he beats him, then Savio, he beats him cleanly, I think. Then Savio Vega gets in the ring. By the way, uh, Gorilla Monsoon had come down to the ringside and banned the Nation of Domination from the ring. They all had to stand at the top of the ramp and watch it from, af from afar. So yeah, he beats Crush cleanly, and Savio Vega gets in there. Then in a decent match, then Savio cheats, and uh, basically batters Ahmed Johnson with a steel chair. 
So now Ahmed's battered, but he gets the win, obviously, by disqualification. So now Savio goes to the back, then Farouk comes down. Farouk and uh, Ahmed Johnson. Now, this is where I was thinking, right, this this must be it. This must be where Ahmed Johnson beats Farouk and ends the storyline. But he doesn't. Farouk goes and beats Ahmed Johnson, having just been beaten down with a chair. Farouk then beats the hurt Ahmed Johnson and gets the win. So, it didn't really make much sense. Ahmed Johnson still not got his revenge on him. I don't think he ever did. I'll, hopefully it'll be resolved in the next pay view, otherwise it'll just be a stupid story then really. But you could tell what they're doing with Ahmed Johnson, they're trying to put him over as like a title contender by having him beat this gang all in one, but they didn't do it, they had the gang beat him in the end. But whatever. All the way through the show by the way, they showed um, five seats at ringside. And earlier on, I think it was in the free for all show, the uh, that was like the poll show that we used to do before uh, the, the pay per views. Uh, had um, a Heart Foundation interview, and basically they said that right, we bought five seats from the scalper at ringside, and we're going to be there for the main event, which is Triple, uh, which is Undertaker, Stone Cold Steve Austin. And we want to be there for that match. We want to get involved, basically. So yeah, next match. So yeah, these seats were just empty for the duration of the show well until the main event but yeah next match no holds barred match Vader versus Ken Shamrock now what they were trying to do here was they were trying to do like an M MMA style match like and also an interesting point from a, the Raw the previous week was the Vincent Mann himself plugged UFC's upcoming pay-per-view so he obviously didn't see UFC as a rival threat to his company and he was trying to build bridges with them I suppose by like saying yeah they've got a pay-per-view coming up why don't you watch it really interesting to see now uh, what's this? 14 years later, that the UFC are absolutely kicking WWE's ass and won't do WWE any favors whatsoever. Surely they own something. I suppose they sent on Ken Shamrock, so that was sort of the trade-off. But still, WWE were helping UFC out when UFC weren't doing too well in the pay-per-view rating. So maybe UFC sh should help WWE out. I wonder what you think about that. Uh, so yeah, this no hold bad style match, Vader versus Ken Shamrock, it was quite boring in all honesty, um, Ken Shamrock got the win with an ankle lock, they, they did it really MMA style where like it was back and forth, then out of nowhere Ken Shamrock just gets the ankle lock and Vader has to tap out straight away, the match dragged on a little bit, just bored me, yeah, and also another key thing to note here is that Vader had just been um, in trouble with was it Kuwait or Qatar? I think it was the people of Kuwait because he was on a uh, TV show there and basically the, the guy asked him, is wrestling fake? And Vader says, it's not fake. How about I grab you right now? And he grabs hold of the guy and he basically assaults him. Not too much. He just like roughs him up a little bit. You might want to check it out on YouTube or I might put a link in the description box if you can find it slash if I remember. Um, so yeah, this was an ideal opportunity for them to build Vader up as a real monster because he's just beating up this guy for calling wrestling fake they should have really pushed him to the main event scene in my opinion but they just put him under this Ken Shamrock who's coming from MMA just beating this monster wrestler showing you what they basically putting MMA over wrestling in my opinion but that's just my opinion but yeah Ken Shamrock gets the win I'm a fan of Ken Shamrock by the way I'm not trying to put him down I really enjoyed his work later on in the WWE and another thing to mention was Ken Shamrock's music in this was so bad it was horrible Um. It wasn't the cool one that he had later on in like 1999. This was really, a really bad generic song. Then we got the main event, World Wrestling Federation Championship match. Undertaker versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. The Hart Foundation come to ringside to watch. Both Austin and Undertaker are cheered. The heels are just watching at ringside. Now, it doesn't make sense, like, wrestling-wise, because this is the main event of the pay-per-view. This should really matter more what's happening in the ring than what's outside. But... It sort of built into a better thing, and it wasn't. It was done in a way where it made sense. It didn't really. It wasn't just like out of nowhere, like like where you'd be thinking, "What's going on here? Why are they doing this?" It made sense. So Undertaker and Austin. It was a decent match. At one point, Austin stunners the Undertaker. He goes to the pin, and the ring bell rings, and you look over, and it's Brian Pillman. Brian Pillman, and he's ringing the ring bell. Another interesting thing to mention about this match. It was all the way through it. Jerry the King Lawler was just referring to the Hart Foundation as fans at ringside. All oh, these fans are getting really into it. These fans are fighting with Austin and these fans are fighting with Undertaker. Whereas Jer um, Jim Ross was just getting really annoyed with King. Just by saying, they're not fans. They're wrestlers. They're wrestlers. Can we just mention that these are not fans? These are. This is the Hart Foundation. I think uh, 
Jay, I was trying to cover the fact that they don't want other people watching this thinking, hey, I can get involved when I go to watch wrestling, do you know what I mean? But yeah, um, part of the match, Austin just rolls out of the ring and pulls Owen Hart out from the ringside. Owen Hart had just won the IC title about two, three weeks back, two weeks back in fact, from The Rock, uh, which was really interesting because now the Hart Foundation had the tag team titles on Owen and Bulldog, the IC title on Owen and the European title on Bulldog. So the only title that they didn't have was the World Heavyweight title, which was on the line in this match between Undertaker and Austin. And also, Brian Pillman had just um, come back and attacked Austin and joined the Heart Foundation, well it seemed. Well, he'd been claiming that he wasn't a part of the Heart Foundation, but they'd been doing these segments on Raw where he'd be praying for the Heart Foundation. It was quite weird and not that entertaining, but it's original, so whatever. But yeah, Undertaker in the end got the win over Austin, and after the match, the Heart Foundation come in and they attack Austin and The Undertaker in the ring while Bret Hart sits at ringside in his wheelchair. He's been in a wheelchair at this point, uh, playing up that he's injured. Um, but yeah, basically while the Hart Foundation are in the ring beating up uh, The Undertaker, Austin rolls outside and starts beating up Austin, uh, beating up Bret. And then in the ring, some of the Hart Foundation come out to help Bret, while Undertaker like chalk slams two of them. Austin gets back in the ring and then they basically fight off everyone. Then Austin stunners The Undertaker and then gets the upper hand, but Undertaker's already won. So it keeps Austin looking strong, it gets Undertaker over as the champ, back obviously because he won the match. Um, overall, what would I rate this pay-per-view? Six and a half out of ten, I'm guessing. There's a big improvement from the last one, I've got to say. Um, you can really tell that they were building to what, uh, something really big between Bret Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin. They'd already had the good match on the pay-per-view before this in your house 14 Avenger Taker. They also had the good match at WrestleMania 14, WrestleMania 13, and then Survivor Series 1996. They had a good match. So you can tell they're really building towards something. It's a real shame that in the end Bret Hart had to be basically forced out the door of the WWE and sent to the WCW, but yeah, um, you can tell that that's what they were building towards basically, and this was a decent decent shot, and all in all, like I said, 6.5 out of 10, match of the night, it's a toss up between the Flashpunk Triple H match and the Undertaker Stone Custody of Austin, because they're both good for different reasons, but yeah, I would recommend watching this pay-per-view just from a historical standpoint, it's good to see where Austin came from, where the Undertaker, how the Undertaker used to be, because the Undertaker's been built quite strongly throughout his WWE career, so it's interesting to see that even 14 years ago he's been booked strongly. Uh, interesting to see how Austin progressed, how they brought in Ken Shamrock and how they were going, going with that. And obviously how The Rock was uh, back then when he was basically just a jabroni basically. Now he's the, pretty much the shit isn't he? He's, he's the man in wrestling. So yeah, um, let me know what you think about this pay-per-view. Have you watched it? Have you not watched it? And with that I'm out. If you enjoy my videos please click the subscribe button. Please rate if you liked it or if you didn't like it. I don't mind if you click the thumbs down button down there, that's your opinion. But yeah, uh, with that I'm out, thanks for watching.